speak to us. We're going to read uh, the passage he's going to speak on. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 to 18. A glorious passage of scripture. One of the first passages I ever preached on. So well loved. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 7. Now Paul is talking to the church in Corinth about his ministry. He says, now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness. For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is the word of God. Thanks so much for your, your warm welcome. So good to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, I think I checked while I was sitting in the pews. Last time I was here was 2018. Um, it feels like a lot changes in five years, but in some ways, lots doesn't change. And um, what I want to talk about really this morning is the idea of change. I'm getting signals from the back. Am I not switched on? Ah, good old technology. Uh, so I think I flicked the mute switch by accident. Is that better? <laughs> Loud now. That's another thing that doesn't change, technology. Always a pain. Um, you don't need me to tell you that things need to change, do you? Um, as we look at the headlines, just take a sample of the headlines. War, strikes, scandals. Uh, apparently there's e even rumors that the Spice Girls are cons considering a reunion tour. A um, lot of bad news going on. <laughs> Fortunately, that last one's just a rumor. Um, and even headlines aside, what about in, in your life or in the life of the church? Um, even though you're here in God's house on a Sunday, I'm sure there's things that you'd love to change about your situation, about your life, right? Um, health concerns, family conflict, relationships, work. Is there any of us here who could honestly say this morning that we've got our lives sorted, we've discovered the secret? Probably not. So the question is then, how do we change? We've heard a lot about sin this morning, our state before God of, of falling short. How do we change that? How do we change the, the, the problems in our lives and the problems in our world? And if we're honest, as we kind of look around on a Sunday, sometimes our Christian response can seem a bit weak, can't it? You know, we come here for an hour or so, we sing a few songs, we 
kind of listen to someone spouting hot air from the front. It can seem a, a bit of a lame response, considering the scale of the problems and how deeply we feel them in our, our own lives. What do we do with this messy world and our messy lives? Even when we say, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Well, am I alone in thinking that even that sometimes seems a bit too simple, a bit too basic? You know, what do we actually do when the problems go deep? What do we do when you're fighting something that doesn't change in your life? Well, you know, if that's what you're thinking then you're not alone, Uh, because Paul, who wrote this letter of of 2 Corinthians, um, he was one of the early followers of Jesus. He gave the best years of his life to be a traveling preacher, to take that message of Jesus around the Roman Empire of the day. Uh, He was teaching, he was preaching, he was helping gather new believers into the first churches in those cities with names like Ephesus, Galatia, Philippi. And then Corinth, which is where he sent this letter to Corinthians, to the church in Corinth. And Paul faced criticism of, of a similar kind to what I've just said. Um, Paul, uh, Corinth was a spectacular and an impressive city. Um, if, if you want a kind of comparison, maybe think Cambran, but with a few more Greek restaurants. No, don't think Cambran. Think, think kind of London or think Paris, you know, grand architecture, innovation, trade, luxury. And so in comparison to all this impressive stuff, Paul's little old traveling ministry just looked a bit pathetic in comparison. What was he actually achieving? What was he accomplishing? That's what the critics would say of Paul, it all looked a bit simple and a bit basic. He wasn't making heaps of money like the other leaders of the day. He, he didn't have a, a fancy toga or a red carpet or a, a bodyguard accompanying him. And you know, honestly, even Paul's public speaking was considered to be a little bit poor, a bit basic, especially compared to, wow, those, those Greek and Roman philosophers, they were the, the men, they were the guys. Um, those, the Corinthians in, in the city of Corinth were used to hearing these, these celebrity speakers who would arrive with grand letters of recommendation. Um, you know, I kind of think of them a bit like those quotes you get on, on the movie posters. You know, blockbuster eloquence, sizzling rhetoric, five-star thrill ride coming soon to an amphitheater near you. That's what they were used to. But Paul had his own letter of recommendation. And he points to it in chapter 3, verse 2. If you've got got your Bible, you can look outside what will be on the screen. But chapter 3, verse 2, Paul says, You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. What had Paul's ministry achieved? Well, in Corinth, it had brought the church of Corinth, the people and their changed lives. That was Paul's movie poster, as it were. That was his letter of recommendation. It wasn't grand. They weren't grand. They were a a bunch of ragtag misfits like every church on the planet, right? They weren't outwardly impressive. But what God had done there and what Paul had, had done there was a miracle for those who were willing to look beneath the surface. What God is doing here in you is a miracle when you look below the surface. Listen to verse 3. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone but on tablets of human hearts. Tablets of human hearts. What was Paul's ministry achieving? What's the point of us being here today at church? Well, it's actually something huge, something amazing, something that we need and something that you're not going to find an answer for anywhere else. The changing of human hearts, the changing of lives. 
Now, we started by talking about bad news headlines, but the good news headline that I, I want you to take away today is this. Changed lives change lives. Bit of a tongue twister, but changed lives change lives. Can you say that with me? Changed lives change lives. How are we going to impact this world? When our lives are changed by something outside of ourselves, something greater than ourselves. Let's get into the passage. Um, Verses 7 to 18 is the passage we're looking at, and it splits into two. Verses 7 to 11 first. And we're going to look look at that under the heading, the one change that lasts, verses 7 to 11. And then we'll look at verses 12 to 18 under the heading, the one goal of change. So first, verses 7 to 11, the one change that lasts. Now, Corinth was in Greece, and the Greeks had a myth about a man called Sisyphus who was given a terrible punishment. He was given a task that he had to complete in order to be released. And that, that task involved a large boulder, and it involved a steep hill. And you can probably put two and two together and guess what his task was. He had to push that boulder to the top of this hill. But what Sisyphus didn't realize was that the higher he pushed, every muscle strained inch by inch, the higher he pushed, the bigger that boulder became, the heavier it got. And so inevitably, eventually, like two members of your church trying to jump across the stage, Sisyphus had to give up, and that boulder boulder rolled all the way back down the hill, and he had to start all over again. He couldn't do it, and he was destined to repeat his futile, pointless task of pushing that boulder up the hill for the rest of eternity. Now, even if you're not a muscly Greek hero like some of you here, it's a powerful picture, isn't it? It's a a powerful picture of how hard it really is to change, right? Whatever we try, we just end up back where we started. Whether that's in the world, with another new government arriving, with more new promises about all the things they're going to change, only to repeat the exact same cycle that the previous government repeated. Or whether it's in our own lives, you know, setting those optimistic New Year's resolutions, uh, only to have broken them before the end of January the 1st, maybe, if you're doing well. (laughs) Anyone still keep New Year's resolutions, still make New Year's resolutions? I suspect most of you have arrived at that place of wisdom in life where you realize there is no point in making New Year's resolutions because you will just break them, right? But that just illustrates the point. Change never seems to last, does it? And Paul knows that feeling of frustration. He looks back to his own boulder in this passage. His own thing that he felt he had to push up the hill again and again. It's something that the Jews had, the people of Israel had. It's something which he calls the ministry of death. There you go. Put that on the movie poster. The ministry of death. Verse 7. If the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even even more glorious? Paul looks back and contrasts this new wonderful thing, the ministry of the Spirit, with this old ministry that brought death, or in verse 9, the ministry that brought condemnation. What, What was this ministry that brought death? Well, put together the clues. The Israelites were involved, talks about Moses. So if if you know a little bit about your Bible, you can put those pieces together. We're talking about that event where God gave the law to his people, the people of Israel. Thunderclouds, Mount Sinai, God engraving his law, the Ten Commandments, uh, onto stone tablets so that all the people would know the rules. And for the people of Israel, those rules came with glory, right? A message directly from God 
Wow, what a privilege. A new law to mark out their nation as different from all the others. A new set of commandments, precepts and rules for them to obey. But even as I say those words, right, your hearts sink, don't they? There's something in us, right? You hear commandments, you hear rules, you hear laws. We cringe inside, right? Because those things feel heavy. They feel like that boulder on a steep hill. Why is that? Why do we get that sinking feeling? I can't have been alone in feeling it as we read the definition of sin earlier, right? It's heavy stuff. And it's because laws, even God's good law, especially God's good law, shows us a painful truth, doesn't it? Even when the laws are good, even when we agree that those laws are good and keeping them would be a good thing, don't lie, don't steal, don't desire what doesn't belong to you. I mean, how amazing would our politicians be if they kept those laws? How amazing would we be if we kept those laws? Laws make us feel heavy. Commandments make us feel heavy because as hard as we try, we can't keep them, can we? The boulder keeps rolling back down and we're back to where we started. Except we're not, are we? We're not back to where we started because actually we feel even more depressed and more discouraged and more defeated than we did before. Am I the only one who's been in that place? The thing is, laws give us A promise of change, a vision of what change could look like, but they don't give us the power to change. Think of a diet, right? Some of us need to think of diets more than others, I imagine. Maybe it's New Year, you hop on the scales, and uh, then you hop off again very quickly with horror. And a new diet seems to be the answer, right? It holds out a promise of change, a vision of how your life could be, a healthier you, a happier you, a slimmer you, right? That diet's wonderful for a few days, and then things get hard, and compromises come in, and you're in the supermarket, and oh, some of those forbidden substances just fall into the shopping trolley, and you don't have the willpower to take them out again. It's the promise of change, isn't it? without the power to change. And we need that power to change. That was the problem with the law. That's what the Israelites discovered over hundreds of years of history. That's what you'll find if you read the Old Testament through from start to end. It's the depressing cycle of having your eyes lifted to an ideal, the promise of change, but not having the power to change, not having the power for lasting change. And it's not just true of God's law to the Israelites. It also applies to all of the self-help, self-care, self-improvement mumbo-jumbo that you'll hear around us today. The books, the podcasts, the courses, the apps, the retreats, the, the breathing techniques. All of those things fail to bring lasting change because they're relying on self for the power. So they condemn us to, to keep trying And we've got a Christian version of that as well, haven't we? You've been forgiven, you've been saved, now it's time to get on the Christian treadmill. Have you done your quiet time this morning? Are you going to be at church next Sunday? You know, we can start heaping up those laws and those burdens again on us without even trying too hard. It's kind of built in, isn't it? But what we need is not more rules, what we need is... The power, the power to change. And the wonderful news of of the new covenant that Paul talks about, this this glorious ministry that Paul talks about, is it comes with the power to change. Paul says the ministry of the Spirit is going to be even more glorious than the ministry of the law because it's different. Verse 11 If what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? There's one change that lasts. It's the ministry of the Spirit. It's a glorious change that God himself is working in us. 
Now, we're going to look at that in, in more detail in the second half of the passage. I say that, I now look at the clock and I think, are we? <laughs> we need to, okay? And I'm sorry it's uh, going on long. We'll skip ahead to the second half of the passage. Uh, so, we've done the one... The one, uh, we've done the one change that lasts, the Spirit, the power of the Spirit in human hearts. But let's move on to consider the one goal of change, verses 12 to 18, the one goal of change. Now there's loads to take in in these verses, especially when we've got, you know, a minute left of the sermon. Um, <laughs> I remember... When I was little, my dad teaching me how to use a cricket bat. You know, he showed me how to hold it, he showed me how to swing it, but the key was one phrase. And I imagine most of you in here will have heard this phrase. The key was that one phrase, keep your eyes on the ball. Okay, keep your eyes on the ball. Why did he say that? Because sooner or later, if you, if you do that one thing and you just keep your eyes on the ball, However bad your swing starts off as, however bad your grip is, those things will come together if you just keep your eyes on the ball and you go for it, right? Keep your eyes on the ball. Get that one thing right and everything else falls into place. It's a complicated section. This, this talk of God's spirit can be hard to get your head round. But let's end with the one thing to keep our eyes on, the one, one thing that's going to help everything else fall into place. The one reason I'm drawn to this passage again and again, for those of you with good memories, I've already preached it at Pontedrin before, um, the one reason is it shows us the ultimate goal of the Spirit's change in our lives. It's like that phrase, keep your eyes on the ball. When we see the Spirit's goal, everything else follows and falls into place. So let me read verse 18. And I want you to see the goal of the Spirit's work in our hearts and our lives. Verse 18. We all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. What's the Spirit's goal here? Check you're still awake. What's the Spirit doing with us? Shout it out, someone. Transforming, right, transforming. As we with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, we're being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The Spirit's goal is to transform us, to change us into the glorious image of Jesus himself. That's the goal of our Christian lives. That's what God is working in our Christian lives. Yes, we're forgiven and that's glorious. Yes, we're going to heaven and that's glorious. But God's goal in our lives is to make us like his son and that's even more glorious. He's not just turning us into robots who follow his, his will. He's turning us into children who look like our father. Hallelujah for that. That's what we want, isn't it? That's what we ache for, to be made whole and complete and like Jesus. It's such a great goal. And I wish I'd left more time to uh, unpack this for you. But let's, uh, let's rest with, with the part we play in that work of, of the Spirit in our lives. What part do we play in, in this process? Well, in that verse, it says, as we all with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, we're being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is, who is the Spirit. The Spirit does the work in our hearts of showing us who Jesus is, of removing what Paul talks about, that veil, so that for the first time we can see Jesus, not with our eyes, but with our hearts, as we read the pages of Scripture, we can see him come alive in those pages. We can see who he is. We can see his love, his compassion, his truth. We see who 
Jesus is. And what part do we play? What rules do we have to keep? Just one. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Any other day, looking at the sun is not something you'd recommend, right? Me and Megs were out for too long in the sun yesterday, and you can see the effects. A uh, little bit of sunburn. Didn't think that was possible in April in Wales, but there you go. A bit of sunburn. If you look at the sun for too long, at best you'll get sunburn, at worst you'll go blind. But if you look at Jesus, the sun, well, that's essential, isn't it? That's where we find life. As the passage says, contemplating the sun. This word that's got this kind of deep meaning, this, this idea of, of, of looking at Jesus, of considering Jesus and who he is, of loving him more and more deeply. And as we do that, God himself does that wonderful work of transforming us to become more and more like him. It's the power of hero worship, right? You've heard that phrase, hero worship. You've got the poster of your hero on, on your bedroom wall as a teenager. You start buying the clothes of your hero and you start dressing more like them, cutting your hair like your footballing hero. And there's no effort involved in that, is, is there? The love that you have, the admiration that you have for your hero naturally leads to you wanting to become like, like them. And as we behold the Lord Jesus and choose to turn our eyes on Jesus and look at Jesus, then God will change us from being followers of a law to followers of a person. Christians, Christ followers. I pray that, that God would, would give us that single-minded focus that we keep our eyes on Jesus and by the power of the Spirit become more and more like him. Let's, let's pray and then we're going to sing our closing song. Father God, we thank you for the glorious ministry of the Spirit, which is so different to that old way of law and condemnation and death. Thank you that in Jesus we have freedom and the power to change through your Spirit. Lord, help us not to look inward to ourselves for any strength that we might be able to muster, but instead to depend on you as you want us to do, Lord. We thank you that you're a God who loves to give strength, who loves to equip us with what we need for life and for godliness. Uh, thank you, Lord, that you're not asking us to push that boulder up the hill, uh, but you've taken our burdens away. You've freed us to live as we were meant to, following in the footsteps of Jesus, gazing at his face in love and worship. Lord, transform us over the years, in the ways that we don't see, over those moments where pennies drop and, and, and we see something new in your word or you reveal something new to us, Lord. Uh, but help us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Let's stand together.